happy Father's Day. Thank you. Well, good morning, church. How are we this morning? I think you're more than fine. You're awesome. You're beautiful. You're outstanding. I gotta, I, let me share something with you that I, I haven't shared. Um, so some of you know that I'm working on uh, my master's degree right now, and so I go to Moody Bible Institute. And we attend chapel there. And there have been many days in chapel where I have stopped singing, and I've turned around. I often tend to sit in the front uh, I'm, a, I'm a first row student, so if you hate that person, that is me. That's, I'm, I'm the guy that loves to sit up front and be engaged. <laughs> and so, um, sitting in the front of chapel, and there's been times where I've stopped singing, I've just turned around, and it amazed me. And uh, Now, Moody's a small school. There's about 1,500 students there, but the vast majority are, are these are kids. They're 18 to, to 24 is probably the average there. And to hear them sing with passion and joy is so inspiring to me that the, the next generation that's coming up behind us is engaged with God. And they're not just singing out of obligation. They're singing because they love the Lord. Church, I heard that this morning. I love listening to you sometimes. I can't imagine how it pleases our Father in heaven to hear you sing with passion and love. Don't ever be afraid to hold your voice back. I've joked around from stage, I joke, but it's true, I'm a horrible singer. Nobody wants to hear me sing, I can assure you of that. But here's the thing, when we sing together as a body, that's beautiful to God. And it took me years to recognize that. And I used to hold back my voice because it was like, oh, nobody wants to hear that. That's terrible. I can't carry a tune to save my life. When I'm singing with the entire church, with the body of Christ, that is beautiful. So continue to pour out your voice to God. Worship him. I encourage you in that. So I want to encourage you also. We are in a series called the Psalms. And I hope that you are engaging with this material. I hope that you're finding this beneficial, that you're seeing the Psalms maybe in a way that you've never seen before, and you're learning different aspects as we go through this series. This morning, we're going to be talking about the Messianic Psalms, and I'm going to explain that in a second. But let me, let me remind you of the Psalms, because I think it's important to, to remember how this occurs so If we go back to the first of the year, if you remember, I gave a sermon on how to read the Bible, and I gave you this very weird diagram, and if you remember, at the top of that page was this, basically, there was a line that ran all the way through, and then it dropped down at certain points, and what that line up on top represents is a historical narrative. It is something that is continuing on. It is our history that's being played out. But when it drops down into those other books, those books are supplemental. They're saying something else. The book of Psalms, in particular, is not really, you can't think of it as a static book that interjects at one point. It's kind of interjecting at different points into the historical narrative. That's so important to understand because that's why human emotion is poured out from the Psalms because it occurs at different points in history where you have these these different emotions where sometimes it is joy that is being uh, expressed, sometimes it's misery, sometimes it's anger. There's all different kinds of psalms. And so it's important to remember that perspective because we're interjecting history itself when we enter into the psalms. So when I talk about the Messianic psalms, let me give you a quick definition on that. The Messianic psalms are psalms that celebrate David's kingdom looking beyond the reality of David's own reign to the future reign of a perfect king. Now, it's important that we start with the right perspective. So the Messianic Psalms are saying, hey, we're, we're looking forward to this perfect king that's coming. I want to say that because sometimes when we think about a Messianic king, we think about Christ, and Christ is our Savior. 
And yes, he is. But we're not focusing on Christ as our Savior in this. I'm not dismissing that. What I'm saying is we're focusing on his role, if you will, as, as king, as perfect king. So when we talk about the Messianic Psalms in particular, we are looking towards this perfect king that's coming. So it's, it's how he will function in this role, okay? Now, before we make the leap into talking about the psalm, we have to bridge a gap because when I gave you that definition, I said it it's, comes from David's line looking forward. So we have to look at David. We've got to start there. Now, David is one of the most gifted and most versatile individuals in the Old Testament. He is second only to Moses in Israel's history. He was keenly conscious that God had enabled him to establish a kingdom, it was in that context that he was given the messianic promise of an eternal kingdom. So David knows that from his line there's going to be this eternal kingdom. Awareness of a vital personal relationship with God is expressed more consistently by David than by any of the faithful men and women who preceded him. He knew that it was not legalistic observance of rules or rituals that made him acceptable to God. It wasn't offerings or sacrifices. They could not atone for his sin or our sin if no one has repentance or humility. Many of David's prayers are as appropriate for Christians today as they were for the God-fearing people in the Old Testament. David's writings show that knowing God was real in the Old Testament times as it was for the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, even though the full revelation of God and Jesus Christ was still in the future. So it's perspective, right? When we talk about these Psalms, these were Old Testament, so this is before Christ, but it's saying that there's a perfect king that's coming. David was certainly the role model for all Israelite kings. God's covenant with David was the deciding factor as God wrestled with David's disobedient successors on the throne. Even as Israel rebuilt the temple, they followed the directions of the king of King David of Israel. So we are reading the Bible chronologically. I hope that you're still engaged with that. I hope you've been doing that through this, uh, through COVID. As you do that, now we're going to start entering into First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and we're going to enter into the prophets as we travel through history, through the Old Testament. And as we do that, you're going to understand what that comment just meant. There's a lot of bad kings. There's 40-some kings in Israel. Most of them are bad. There's really only about four that are considered good. But only David, this is important, only David was considered to be a great king. God said he was a man after his own heart. He's considered to have a complete heart towards God. So David's kingdom represented the epitome of Israel's power and influence during the nation's Old Testament history. Now we all know that David wasn't a perfect person. David sinned, and he had a lot of family issues. So when we look at this, we're saying, well, why, why are we pointing out David? Because he's the best king that Israel had. And justifiably so. We can say that he was the best king. It would be like, let me give you a comparison. And it's a poor one. But if we, if we were to look at our own American history and we say, well, I think George Washington was a great president because he helped found the, the country. Or we can point to Abraham Lincoln and he helped abolish slavery. Maybe... So we're pointing out these great presidents that we've had in the past. This is exactly what we're doing here. We're pointing towards David and we're saying he was a great king, but he wasn't perfect. And there's a perfect king that's coming. So if you have your Bibles with you, let, let us jump into the Psalms and start listening to what God is telling us this morning. So if you would open your Bible to Psalm 2. Let me give you a little bit of context here. So this psalm, again, is written in the Old Testament times. This is hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. So they're, they're looking forward, and I want you to have that mindset. 
So we're in Psalm 2, begins in verse 1. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The king of the earth, the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed in my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry. And your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is the word of our Lord. Now we, as we just read that, just a once over, you can certainly hear the message of a future king in that. But there's so much more that's actually being said. So let us take some time this morning and go through and discover what God is really telling us. So if we look at verse 1, it says, Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? Well, this is a rhetorical question. The psalmist is is really saying, well, do something else. Why pursue a way that cannot possibly succeed? He's kind of poking fun at them. The rhetorical question vents the psalmist's annoyance, amazement, and resentment at the ignorance of the nations to conspire against God. Did you hear the depth of that? If we don't start from the right place, we won't end up in the right place. The psalmist is saying, are you are you kidding me? You want to take on God? Really, that's your plan. The creator of the universe. Okay, well, let's continue on. In verse 2, it says, The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. Well, we can think of this when it says, um, rise up, that they're taking a stand, and when it says, band together. Literally, it's meaning sitting together. There, Note the deliberation. This is a conspiracy. They are conspiring together to come together as a unified force against God. So there is an active role that they are working towards together. And they're doing it against God and who? His anointed. Well, anointed in Hebrew, one meaning can mean Messiah. In the Greek, another meaning can mean Christ. They're conspiring against the king whom God has chosen and exalted. In other words, the whole world, without exception, opposes the rule of God and his king. It's not a good time in history, is it? This is a prophetic psalm. It's looking forward to what's coming. So it's saying the world is is crazy. Can we pause there for a second? I think you already know where I'm going, don't you? By the chuckles. Our world's in a crazy time. Can we just, let, let's just separate America. This isn't even an American statement. This is a global statement. How many leaders in our world today are actively seeking God and his word and his guidance to lead the people of this earth? Do you see how far we've drifted? This isn't a minor problem. This is a global problem now. We have very few leaders who are pointing towards God and saying, he is the creator of the world. He he is the one who gives us wisdom. He is the one that leads us. I will listen to him to lead the people that I am responsible for. Do you hear the humility in that statement if you were a world leader? Yet, we lack humility in our world today. We want to be boastful. We want to show how much power that we hold. This is a dangerous time in our world. And listen to what the kings and the rulers say in verse 3. 
Now, this is the rulers and the kings that are saying this, and they're saying this to God, okay? Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. Let me paraphrase this. Let us break God's chains and throw off his shackles. What that's meaning is that the world leaders, in solidarity with their subjects, regard the Bible, or God's book of the law, which his anointed king upholds, they regard it as bondage to us, the regenerate, who gladly submit themselves to God's rule. It is a law that gives us freedom from Satan's and sin enslavement. What do we mean by that? This, this book right here is full of instruction. Some people say, well, that's binding. I don't like what it says. That's hurtful. That's mean. We can't do that anymore. That's old. So much so that what the psalmist is saying is, we need to throw this thing away. This isn't any good anymore. It's restricting me. It is literally chains and shackles that are holding me back from how I want to lead. Church, this very book, I hope, I'm not being dramatic when I do this, I hope you feel this, that you want to hold on to this because it's not instructions, it's not laws, it's the love of God being spoken to you. When you come to know this book, it brings a freedom beyond understanding. It gives you wisdom. It gives you peace. It loves you. I can't explain how, but it loves you. This isn't shackles and chains. This is freedom. Please, please have the right perspective. So do you see how the law or the Bible actually saves people from eternal death and destruction? Yet, these kings and rulers aren't seeing that. So we get to verse 4. After the kings and the rulers say, let us throw off their chains and throw off their shackles. In verse 4 it says, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. I love this. Pay attention to what's being said there. It said, the one enthroned, meaning the one that sits on a throne. I want to point this out. And where is that person sitting? In heaven. Okay? Let's set a right perspective. He's sitting in heaven, and he's looking down. Has all the knowledge in the world. He can see everything that's going on, and there's God looking down. And he sees the world leaders conspiring to attack him. And he laughs. I love that. I love that word. He laughs. Are you kidding me? You can't even come up here to fight me. But I'll come down. If you want me to, I'll come down. Their challenge to his authority is simply ludicrous. It really is. It says in verse 5, he rebukes them with his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. Saying, and I intentionally left off there, he's going to say something here. So God is full of wrath and anger. It's been awoken at this point. And he's going to say something. Remember this, for God to speak is for him to act. When we go back to Genesis... Gen when God speaks in Genesis, he creates the world. It's not just words, it's action being lived out. We just read last week the destruction. God will speak destruction. His words are literal action. So he's getting ready to say something. In verse, uh, in verse 6, he makes a statement. He says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. What he's doing here is meeting the worldwide opposition to his rule with the sovereign declaration that it is he himself who installs his king in the royal city that he set apart for himself. So last week, we talked about the Psalms of Zion. 
Remember that? Do you remember what I said Zion represents? Anyone? The dwelling place of God? So Zion isn't a static place. Remember we talked about how history, how Zion moved? It is the dwelling place of God. And now we have in this psalm, it says, I have installed my king in Zion. I love how scripture does this. It knits itself together. You would think for 66 books that you'd have 66 different points of view and the thing would be disconnected. But in reality, within those 66 books, you not only have this knitting together, but it becomes tight and locks itself in. And the more you know that, the more secure you become in understanding God's word. And so in this, it is God declaring it. Let me make a point. This November, we have a presidential election, and we're going to cast a vote for a president, yes? When this happens, what the psalmist is talking about, God installs them. God doesn't need your vote. Let me say that again. God doesn't need your vote. You don't get a say. God is declaring this, and so it is in this verse that he says, I have installed my king. This is who is going to rule the world, and he will do it from this place. And then in verse 7, he says, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. We can think of the interpretation of this passage as describing the inauguration of Christ as the messianic king, the son of God. This literally is his inauguration. Just as when the president is elected and we have an inauguration, this is what's happening in this verse right here, in these first few verses. We're seeing the inauguration. God is saying, this is my king, he is my son, and this is who will rule the world. This is important to understand because it says that the king rules by divine authority. See, that's a term, though, that we really don't think about today. Divine authority. Meaning his authority is pure. It's holy. It's true. It's righteous. It's perfect. Whatever he does, whatever he declares, is correct and perfect in every single way. So it's important to understand that it is God that's anointing this king. And then he continues on in verse 8, and he says, Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. (laughs) Well, right here, the hopes of the rebellious kings and rulers are destroyed. What God is saying is Christ is going to reign over the entire earth. That's his. That's his inheritance. You don't get any of it. I think it's... Knowing that, if we go back to verse 1, when the psalmist is asking that rhetorical question, why are you even asking this question? Why are you going there? Well, this is why. You, You don't have a chance. This is God's earth. He does with it as he wills. Verse 9, it says, You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Now, just a few weeks ago, we talked about Psalm 23. You remember, we talked about the rod and the staff. Remember when I talked about the staff, I had my grandfather's cane, and I said the staff was used to guide the sheep, to keep them in line. You remember what I said about the rod? The rod was a weapon that was tucked in to the shepherd's belt, and it's a weapon to be used against predators that come against the sheep. Again, we're going to see this with Scripture. It's coming together. He says, you will break them with a rod of iron. Well, why iron? Because it denotes severity. Christ is going to beat them with this rod of iron, and it says, you will dash them to pieces like pottery. Now, we know if you throw pottery against the wall, it breaks into a hundred different pieces. In other words, this is utter destruction. Those that 
rebel against God will be completely and utterly destroyed. Now, let me pause there for a second. For some of you, you may be saying, well, that's, that seems pretty harsh. When we start talking about destruction, that can seem almost like it's a bad thing. May I remind you that we serve a good and loving Father. Listen to verse 10 very, very carefully. Therefore, you kings be wise, be warned, you rulers of earth. We could transfer the I'm sorry, we could translate the word therefore for now. Now, you kings, right now, you kings and you rulers, be wise, be warned. In other words, listen to what I'm telling you. God's giving them a second chance. Do you hear it? Before he unleashes his wrath, God is saying, be warned. Be wise. Listen to what I'm saying. Our loving God has not lost his nature. Before he imposes his judgment, he gives them a warning. And he says, be wise. Well, how are they going to be wise? In verse 11, it says, to serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Well, they shouldn't have fear and trembling in them. They're standing before God. We all should. There is a sense of awe that is beyond words itself of the great and glorious majesty of his rule. Remember, this is a king, so we're talking about his ruling us, and it's beautiful. And then in verse 12, it says, Kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. There's a part of me that thinks God is kind of poking fun at us in this verse when he says, kiss his son. See, you have to understand a little bit about world history. In ancient times, when they would elect a new king or there was a new king, during the inauguration, the king would get what's called a signet ring. And this was a very large ring, often very beautiful, was decorated in a specific way, and it signified whoever wore that ring was king. Everybody knew that. And so during the inauguration, the king's subjects and, and the king's leaders themselves would have to come up and either kiss the ring or sometimes they would kiss the feet or the ground in front of the king. And it was a sign of submission and respect. And look what God's doing. It's almost like he's mocking them. <laughs> you, you want to pretend and kiss your little kings. And he said, kiss my son. That's who's worthy of being kissed. Kiss his feet for all that he has done for you. God's always pointing to his son, saying, there, the authority of this inauguration lies in him, in him alone. So, I want you to see these messianic psalms for what they are. It's talking about kingship in this psalm, Psalm 2 this morning, is talking about the inauguration of Christ as king. It's welcoming, welcoming him into that role. Now, I want to say something before I read the next part. I've talked to you so many times about who you select as your next senior pastor and, and how they should run this church. And I've talked so much about the pulpit and how a person should, should lead. Let me give you a warning. As the church moves forward with selecting a senior pastor, there are so many churches out there today that are hiring individuals who um, basically are really good at giving you a pep talk or what we call a TED talk today. Makes you feel good, very energetic, a lot of production. Hey, it's a great time. Let's go to church. I warn you against that, church. Don't you dare do that. 
find a pastor that is going to instruct you. The reason that we take time for these psalms is to make you wiser, to understand God in a way that maybe you never have before, to deepen your relationship, to give you wisdom, to build you up. There's so many different aspects that we're working on here that are intentional. Think about this. As a pastor, I'm lucky if I have 52, one hour, if that, let's say 45 minutes, sessions with you a year to speak to you. You know how precious that time is for me? For any pastor, it's incredibly precious. And so the time that we spend here unpacking this, this isn't for me, this is for you. To get, draw closer to God, to understand him in a way that maybe you never have before. So listen to these words. The reason I'm dwelling on that is because of where we're going to go next. We're going to make a big leap. So we've been talking about the Messianic Psalms. And I want to talk in closing here about this, this linking of Scripture. So Psalm 2 was written very early in Israel's history, not because it's number two, that's just the way that it was written. So it comes earlier on in Israel's history. This is hundreds of years before Christ is born. When Christ comes into the world, he's crucified and he ascends back up into heaven. Now what's interesting here is John knew this. He knew these Psalms and he knew about Christ and he knew that Christ was this messianic king. And so John writes the book of Revelation. And we're going to make a leap here, and I want you to follow along with me. So we're going to go to, uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to jump to Revelation 5. And I want to read this to you, and as I read it, I want you to develop this image in your head. Listen for the words that we've already talked about when we've been discussing Psalms, when we've been discussing Zion, all of that. Listen and see if you hear it in what John is saying. So in Revelation 5, verse 1, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals or even open the scroll? Do you hear the rhetorical question in that? We, we start with a rhetorical question in our psalm this morning. And yet, here it is again, there's this rhetoric like, there's nobody worthy. We already know that. In verse 3 it says, But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth can open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept. That's John. John wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Let's pause. There's your messianic king. Did you hear it? We talked about the root of David this morning in this psalm, and you see how now scripture is pointing back and saying, remember all those times and all those psalms and all those proverbs we were talking about David? Well, here it is. It says, Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now I'm going to pause there. We will have a sermon series on Revelation one day, so don't get wrapped up in the imagery here. We'll, we'll talk about that at a later time. In verse 7, he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. I, I just want to say this. Think about that imagery. Now, I think incense we don't connect with unless maybe you were from the 60s or 70s. Maybe you remember incense. Didn't mean to throw a jab there, I'm just saying. But incense is something pleasing. It's this aroma that is pleasing. And think about it with, 
What John is saying here, the, your prayers, church, your prayers are like incense before God. They are pleasing to him. You're communicating with your creator, with your father, and it's pleasing. I just want you to hear that. And then in verse 9 it says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Now I know I'm doing a ton of diversions this morning, and I apologize for that, but this is important. Did you hear what was said there? With your blood, Christ, with your blood, you purchased for God persons of every tribe and language and people and nation. Church, we got a problem in this country right now. We're very divided, and it's not healthy. It's not healthy at all. We're looking at colors. Some of that is justifiable. There are some very valid arguments that are taking place. There is also some ludicrous statements that are being made at the same time. We have to be wise to discern the difference between the two, but nonetheless, the point is, when we stay focused on what Christ did for us on the cross, what he's given us, it was given for everyone. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not jabbing us here, but, but I want you to hear this. We're predominantly white church. There's a problem with that. Do we live in a white community? Just dwell on that for a second. Shouldn't the church reflect the community that it exists in? We have all different colors. God is saying those, they are beautiful, all of them. I often think when I get to heaven, if it was an all-white heaven, how boring would that be? No, I'm just going to be honest. White people are boring to begin with. But what I really mean by that in depth is if we're all the same colors, it would be boring. Meaning, if it was all black, it would be boring. If it was all brown, it would be boring. But God, in his sovereignty, created us differently. And when we enter into heaven, there is a tapestry. It is beautiful because it is filled with colors. It is rich in tone. We're missing that, church. We need to be engaging with the community around us desperately because they need to hear us. They need to hear the message of Christ for healing because it is only through his truth that we can find healing in this nation. Legislation, I'm not getting political here, legislation, laws, rules, write all of them that you want to, you're never going to fix the condition of the human heart. Only Christ can heal our hearts. We need that so desperately in this world right now, church. So let me continue on. In Revelation 5, I'm on verse 10. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Does that sound like a king? Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the sea and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne, there's your kingship, and to the Lamb be praised and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And the four living creatures said amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Revelation 5 is the inauguration of eternity. It is at that point when we read Revelation that Christ becomes king, and from that point forward we will see the trials and the tribulations and the judgment 
and the ushering in of eternity. This is our starting point. I want you to walk away this morning with a few things, church. I want you to look forward with eager anticipation to the future king who is perfect. Now, let me make a point. Maybe you're not even looking with anticipation to a king. And I'm going way beyond that. I'm saying not only look forward with anticipation, but with eager anticipation. As Christians, we have nothing to fear when this comes. We will be ushered into eternity with Christ. This is a beautiful moment. Because as Christians, we should understand that we will spend eternity with this king. We will be under his rule, and it will be perfect in every single way. There will be no more tears, no more troubles for all eternity. Now, those first two things were for, for how we should look forward, but let me give you something to look forward to today. It's my last point. Like God, we should inform others about Christ before it is too late. When we read this psalm, listen to this very carefully. When we read this psalm this morning, God gave a warning to the kings and rulers. He said, be wise, be warned. Do you hear that? God is speaking to the, his enemies. Church, do we talk to our enemies? Or are we becoming a society that at, treats everybody like social media? It's like, well, I don't like that. Let's scroll by it. And we move through relationships at the speed of a scroll. It's not what we're intended to do. We're meant to share the gospel with this world, with everyone, without exception. Now that's a teaser, because in this fall, we're going we're gonna to start talking about that. We need to do that. Now is the time, church. Now is the time. Don't let that word evangelism scare you. As a Christian, you should learn to embrace it. It becomes part of your DNA. You cannot help but speak of God. And we're going to talk about that. So church, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son. For the promise of a future king who is perfect, who will rule over eternity in a judgment that is righteous and holy and pure and quite frankly is beyond our understanding. Father, I thank you that you have placed this message on the psalmist's heart so long ago and it's been carried throughout history and brought to us here this morning. May this be placed on the hearts of those who hear it. May they struggle with it. May they wrestle with this word that you have given us. May it change them, inform them into the men and women of God that you desire them to be. And that goes for me too, Father. Break me and mold me. Father, we ask all these things in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, if you would like to receive a blessing this morning, would you rise and hold out your hands like this? Church, you now know that you are under rule of a perfect king who will make all wrongs right in the end. He will fix it, and when you enter into eternity, there will be no more tears, no more sorrows, and we will be brothers and sisters enjoying fellowship and worshiping our Savior for all eternity. It is a beautiful picture. May that picture dwell in your heart this week. May you have abundant love that is birthed from that image. And may you take that love and love on others this week. Church, go now. Love on people. Hug somebody. Tell them you love them this morning. And we'll see you next week.